church this morning and uh, Spirit fell upon me and told me how grateful I should be. Amen. Uh, the church is always decorated and always in, I mean, when you come in, you just feel welcome and amazing. And uh, God just kind of let me think, well, you better be prepared because I think it's going to be your year. And, uh, and that's what I'm praying. For this to be our year in the Lord, that we will glorify Him in absolutely everything that we do. So, uh, I am blessed, and I thank you for being my greatest blessing. And I thank the Lord for this all the time. And uh, so this morning when I was reading over my notes for... Uh, this message, I kind of started smiling because it just kind of makes you happy when you see what the Lord does. So, uh, if you notice in your sermon scripture notepad there that I put, what you smiling about? <laughs> see, just reading that makes you a little worried there. But, uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 10 this morning. And uh, have you ever been around someone that smiles all the time? I mean, they'll be standing at the end of the long Walmart aisle. You know, they ain't got one checker and 42 lanes. And that one line is stretched everywhere. Uh, because I, I kind of believe like that one man is. They don't send me a W-2 at the end of the year for checking myself out. So... But that person is standing there smiling. And you're thinking, you know. <laughs> or maybe they're, they're, uh, you're all eating at a table and they serve steak to everybody and it's so tough and done and they're just smiling and eating it like it's precious stuff. Or they hand over their last $100 Monopoly money over and it's the last that they have and they just smile even though they lost. Uh, and then they land on boardwalk, you know. But if you spend enough time with someone that smiles all the time, you're going to smile. You just can't help it. It's contagious. So, uh, so when I see you in the stores or out and about, I want to see you smile. Because today I'm going to tell you what you got to be smiling for. Because we got a great, great thing. And it's because our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. If that don't make you smile, I don't know what will. But that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. And I, I, I want you to uh, try not to smile when we're talking this morning. But I'm going to ask you to stand as we read God's holy word, uh, Luke chapter 10, and I'm going to pray. Father God, it is truly an honor to serve you here. And I thank you for the blessing of all the people that you have blessed me with here, Father. Someone asked me the other day what it was like to be a pastor. I said, well... It's where I really learned how to love. Because I love these people so much. And I feel their love right back. And I can feel the love of Jesus in everything that we're doing. And it just smiles. You have to smile, Father. Because you've blessed us so much. And I'm going to ask you to bless these words again today that you would anoint these words that we would have a clear understanding into our hearts and our lives this morning. Because, Father, life is hard here. There are so much trials and tribulations. And I know, Father, that at the end, it's going to be well worth it. But, Father, I pray for strength and endurance. I pray for wisdom and knowledge. And I pray for each one of the people that are here today and those that are not. 
Father blessed them in an amazing way. And as we start a brand new year, Father, <clears throat> we pray that you put a hedge of protection around this church, these people, as we work for your glory and building your kingdom. Because the evil one will attack. But Father, we are so glad to know you have our hands. You can pull us out. Sometimes we need to have this endurance test, Father, to check our faith. But, Father, I thank you for growing our faith and giving us the ability that we can go out and share the gospel with other people. So, Father, today, as we read your word and, and study it, that you will bless it and you will anoint us. That yes, we'll leave here thanking God for the opportunity to be here. But we're going to feel the love of Christ so much that we just got to share it. Father, I give you all glory and praise. I humble myself before you. Use me, your servant, to glorify yourself. For I ask in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Luke writes here in chapter 10 verse 1 after these things the Lord anointed 70 other also and sent them two by two before his face in every city and place where he himself was about to go and this is what he said to them the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. And whatever house you enter first, say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. And if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborers is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such as they set before you. Now listen what he tells them. And heal the sick there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, The very dust of your city which clings to us we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in the day of Solomon than for that city. All right, thank you. You may be seated. I want to just kind of picture up what Christ is saying here. And uh, Christ is talking to his disciples now these are not the 12 disciples that he's sending out. These are another 70. And if you read the Old Testament, Moses done the, the 70, sent them out two by two. Christ sent his disciples out two by two. He sent these 70 out two by two. So what do you think we ought to do here today? Go out two by two. That's what he's telling us. And then uh, I think it's like a silly question he had to his disciples. Because when you keep reading that story, when they return, they are smiling. They had a great time going out doing what the Lord asked them to do. But I want you to know that uh, your smile, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could smile and cure cancer? Amen. Or heart disease, take away headaches. You know, but God can do that. Did you hear what I said? 
God can take away cancer. Come he on. can take away heart disease. He can take away headaches. Yes. He can take away pain. He can take away sadness. And I could go on and on and on because my God can do all things. Amen. And I know and I believe that if God said it, it's going to happen. Or if God said it, I'm going to be anointed. If God said it, I'm going to be blessed. If God said it, I'm just going to believe it no matter what it said. Amen. If God told me to take my shoes off and I, because I'm in a holy place like he told to Moses, don't you know I'm going to take my shoes and probably throw them because I want to make sure I humble myself before the Lord because that's what I want to do. And I want us as a church to do that. To be ready to go two by two out into the fields. And uh, I want you to know that when they got back that they were smiling. They were excited. And, uh, you know, we can think about things like our family. We can smile because God give us a family. There are some people that have no family whatsoever. We can smile because we uh, just got over a nasty cold or overcome a, a sickness that comes by our way. Or maybe tomorrow's payday. Wouldn't that make you smile? When you know you're going to get your check? All these things will make you smile. But the smile that you have, knowing that your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, is different than all those smiles. When you start talking Jesus, I don't know about you, but I start feeling the Spirit just fluttering up and up and up and up. And I start saying things I didn't even know I had in my head. Things that I, I have read once or twice, but how would I memorize that? It just flows out because the Spirit of the Lord is at work. And so we can smile about the Spirit of the Lord as well. But I want to kind of explain something here. You know, he sent them out two by two. He told them not to take anything with them. And he told them not to talk to people uh, along the way. And he also said to greet them when they entered to the city. Let's talk about these three things. Now, he didn't tell them not to take a, a whole luggage, a suitcase. He said... Your mission's going to be short. You're not going to need a lot of stuff. And I want you to depend on me because what did he tell them? I'm going to send you to places that I'm about to go to. What did John the Baptist do? He shared the word about Jesus about to come. And here he's continued that in his mission and his work here on the earth was to have a forerunner going before him. He sent 70 out. All these places where uh, God was about to send Jesus, Jesus sends these people to prepare. So he said, I'm going to take care of you. You don't need to take all that stuff. Don't even take an extra pair of sandals or a knapsack to carry stuff because you don't need it. So one thing we got to learn this morning is we got to trust God to provide. To give us what we need to do His work. This church needs to open up and say, we can't do it without the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. We can't take credit because it's God's work. And we're just going to go where God's working and help Him. That's what He wants us to do. Just like He told Jesus, or Jesus told them, go to the places I'm about to go to. And then he said, don't talk to people along the way. And I always thought that was very odd. Why would you tell somebody, don't greet someone along the way? Well, when I started studying this, I found out that the greetings of someone along the way would mean sometimes a pretty elaborate ceremony. You might have to uh, go and eat with them. You might have to go for a long time. Uh, there was many customs that had to do when you greeted someone along the way because these people could have been someone that needed help or they were going to help you. And uh, sometimes it took a long time for the greeting to happen. It might last a day or a week or an hour. But in their customs, there was a plan 
that they had from the Old Testament to the New Testament was that if you were doing something in a hurry for the Lord, you could skip greeting someone on the road. And that's what Christ was telling them. we got to hurry up. We can't delay this. we got to keep going. He's not telling us, don't talk to the people. Because where He's sending us, He said, go out to all of the world, didn't He? He didn't tell us to go to a few cities that He was going to. He didn't say, I'm going to be coming to Alton next week. I want you to get prepared. Wouldn't that be great? You knew that. And you could come and say, I'm going to go see God because He's coming to Alton. And more people would flock in. But God told us to go all over the world. He didn't tell us to go to one city. And then He said, when we got into a city, and now we're going to talk about Alton here, and I prayed about this. I thought, man, this might be a harsh thing to say, but this is what God says, so it's not harsh. Right. He said, when you go in, you greet them, and you give them a peace. Now, he said, you go into town, don't go house to house to house. He says, i got to prepare you go into a place, and if they will take you in, give them a peace blessing. Give them peace. And if they are of our kind, if they know Christ as Lord and Savior today, then we are to know that that peace will go upon them. And it's really saying shalom to them, peace. And it really means may God cause you to be well with all of your things. That God will make all things well in your life. Now that's a pretty good blessing, isn't it? Amen. God give us the ability to give people those blessings. Are we doing that? No, I don't think so. When we go into the house of our brothers and sisters, we are to greet them with a holy kiss according to the Word of God because they are of like kind. And He's telling us of this because He's not wanting us to keep mingling with the world. We're going to have to make a separation. We're going to have to choose. And we're going to have to be bold. And we're going to have to stay strong and stay on the Word of God. And don't let people influence us. Even the city of Alton. We don't have to agree with everything that happens. And uh, so He said, if they don't give you, uh, they don't accept you, he says, the curse will fulfill them, and it will merit them. It will follow them. Not a curse that you have, because you have no authority, but the authority Christ gave to you to give to them. So it's very simple that we have to look at these points and understand that we have to be in a hurry. We've got to make a separation here. And we've got to let God take care of us and provide for us. And I think we do most of that. But, you know, I think I'm pretty lax. I'm going to speak about myself. Uh, you know, I've seen some stuff that the mayor's office has done, and I don't agree with it. But I say, oh, it's all. What do you expect? And I go on. Well, guess what? I'm not going on anymore. I'm going to call his office and say, you know, you're not following the Word of God with your plan. Just thought you should know that. Uh, and I'm not going to back or support that. And I'm going to caution you, that might make a mad. But you know, I've only really had one thing that the city of Alton through the mayor's office done, but he has a whole council of people. Just like we have a council of people. So I always prayed for the mayor, and I never prayed for the council. So the mayor gets all this pressure, and he makes the decision. Guess what happens in a church? All the pressure comes into the pastor from the council, and he makes a decision. Well, it better be based upon the Word of God. And that's what we got to check, and we got to start doing these. So uh, when we read God's Word here... And be prepared that God's going to provide. So I don't think the city of Alton is really bad. I don't think the mayor has done a bad job. I think the mayor has done some pretty good stuff. I talked to him. Uh, he's treated me just like he knew me all of his life and he didn't know me from Adam. But you know what? 
even our neighbor can say something and we don't have to agree with our neighbors. And trust me, I said to my neighbor, the uh, man that's in that home, there's some things he said. I said, you know, that's totally not right. I said, I think we're supposed to love our neighbors. He was talking about we should all build fences and barricade ourselves in because these people are going to crash in on us. Get your guns out. Get ready to shoot them when they cross your property line. I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, I think i got to overprotect myself. I said, no, I think you got to protect yourself, yes. But don't barricade your fence in with barbed wire and so nobody can get in. I said, you're supposed to love your neighbor. And you're making it very hard to love you. <laughs> and he got a little upset with me. And I said, but thanks to God, I can love you anyway. And uh, so he don't talk to me as often as he used to, but that's okay. But I did share the plan of salvation with him, and he told me that he has enough God in his life he can get to heaven. Well, that told me he's not going to make it. So I, I, I just come right out and told him, I said, the Bible says there's one way. And he says, oh, you're one of those. I said, yeah, I'm one of those that believe the Word of God. That says there's one way. So uh, after that, he still don't like to talk. But anyway, <laughs> it's okay. So these people go into the city. And this is what happened. They started sharing. They found a home to stay in. Jesus said don't go to house to house because he didn't want them to roam. He wanted one person to take care of them. He says what they eat, you eat. Don't ask for special stuff. You should eat and be prepared because you're worthy of your, your work. And uh, he says, so if they're eating prime rib, you eat it. Or if they're eating bloating, you eat it and you be satisfied. That's what he's talking about. And then you go out and start working. You start your door-to-door -door knocking and sharing the gospel. And when you're done with this community, then he said, this is what you can do. He said, you can heal the sick. You can pray for them. Yep. And through that prayer, God can anoint that person. He also said that you can drive out demons. Now, during this time, that was two of the most major things that people talked about. Was healings, because Christ went all over. He's doing His mission. And you know, during the three years He was out there, what was He doing but healing people? He'd see a blind man and he would tell him, you know, close your eyes and open them again. And guess what? They could see. He told a, a, a lame guy, get up and walk. They dropped the guy through the roof and, and they fought to get him into the crowd. But that guy ran home. That's what Christ did. People were looking for that. And remember, I just told you about Christ removing the legion of demons out of the man on the hill and threw them into the pigs, and the pigs couldn't take it, and they killed themselves. I assume they ran into the water and died. I don't know if the demons died, but Jesus is telling them, there's demons here. Be prepared. And He's also telling you there's sick people out there, and this sickness, I think, is twofold. It's physical and spiritual. How many spiritually sick people do you know? That's the ones we got to be praying the hardest for. So when these 70 returned to Jesus and he was waiting to get a report, and I don't think they all came back at the same time. The Bible doesn't say. I picture them coming in maybe groups, uh, you know, because you're working in the area, and they come back and, Jesus, it was so cool to, to drive out these demons. Oh, it was so cool. And they're laughing. They said, well, we have so much power. And Jesus said, wait a minute. What you smiling about? See, don't you feel that? He said, it is better to smile to know that your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life than to drive out demons. Because them demons are here. Matter of fact, he tells them uh, in Luke chapter 10 and verse 18 
He reminds them that Satan was once in heaven and he fell out of heaven. Christ was there when that happened. He watched the fall of Satan and he says it's no, no doubt that his little minions are going to fall on earth because the master, their leader, fell too. So if the leader falls, what happens to all the workers? They fall. They, they just kind of go that way. So here we're looking at this, and it's so, uh, you know, we get so excited about having the ability to pray and do amazing things. But Jesus said, keep in mind, smile, be happy, reflect that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Don't forget that God warned us that Satan's going to be out there. But greater is he that is in you than he is in this world. We can't forget that. And when Jesus' disciples preached God's word, the Holy Spirit come about. He opened their eyes to the truth and sinners heard the true word of God. That's what happens when we go out and we share God's Word. It's not what we do, it's what the Holy Spirit's going to open their minds, their hearts, and, and they're going to receive God. And I want you to know, I heard many people tell me, you know, I've saved this many people. And I know in my mind that is not correct. Because the Bible says God saves them through the Holy Spirit. And the way that we teach them is to know that they need to open their heart, believe that Jesus came as the Son of God and died for our sins. And God rose Him up on the third day. And He has the ability to cover all of our sins, no matter what they are. Amen. No matter what they are. See, people say, well... God will never forgive me. I say, yeah, God loves to forgive people just like you. Because God wants you to know that He can do all things. That His blood is powerful to cover any type of sin. If we give it to the Lord. And we leave it with the Lord. And here we are. We worry about terrorists. We worry about disease and all this. And God says, yes, it's going to be there. And maybe you might Circumb some of these problems. But guess where you get to go? Mm -hmm. Oh, look, people starting to smile. <laughs> guess where you get to go? But home. Right. To the Father. And He's going to take that body that was withered and worn, and He's going to make it brand new. You're going to have energy. You're going to have a blessing. As a matter of fact, you're going to have a brand new life. You're going to be just like Christ. And we're going to be walking around the throne room of the Father. I can't wait. Man, I got goosebumps thinking about this already. And it's going to be so great when we get there. Because one day during the judgment time, God's going to ask, is His name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? And Jesus is going to say, yes, I've covered His sins with all of my blood. Amen. I'm covered. I'm covered. And His name is written here in the book. And I don't have to worry about it. See, Jesus came as a teammate for us. He prepared us. He says, now I'm going to go to the Father. I taught you. I gave you the rule book. I give you all this. And I'm sending the Holy Spirit to guide and to direct you. He says, now you got to believe in me and go. Believe in Him and go. That's what we as a church need to do. You know, I don't know what it's going to be like, and I, don't, I really don't think I'm going to be able to hear the Lord say this to someone else when they're in the judgment time. In Matthew 7, 23, it says, And I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doer." I don't think we as brothers and sisters in Christ are going to hear that. Because judgment of this type, it's going to be horrifying. But God's going to change our mind that we're going to be like Christ. And you know, Jesus knew that people would mock Him. Remember what He did? He turned the other cheek. 
And when they struck him and they beat him, he didn't call out the angels to curse him, did he? He asked the Lord to bless him. When they nailed him on the cross, he didn't, he didn't scream out, I'm not doing this. He had you on his mind as he put his hands up there, as they drove the nails in his hands and feet. He was our teammate. He was saying, hey, I'm the captain, and I'm going to show you what to do. Three years he showed us. It's recorded. Eyewitnesses told us what Christ told them. Luke, a great physician that loves to document, a historian as well, recorded great things. That the witnesses, the ones that seen it, felt it. The ones that stepped around the fire at night to talk with Jesus. The ones that laid their head on rocks just like Jesus did because He didn't have a, a place to, to call home at that time. And don't you think it would have been so cool to see the very first miracle? Jesus at this long party, this wedding party that usually lasted a week, and they run out of wine and Mary, knowing who Jesus is, said, my son will take care of it. See, I want this city to say North Alton Baptist Church will take care of it because they believe. They will pray. They will work and strive to glorify God in all that they do. And uh, I joined several group meetings and I've learned very fastly you don't miss one of those meetings because they will elect you into things you don't want to do. But you're doing it for the glory of the Lord, so you got to smile and go on. So, uh, but I was thinking about that miracle, the very first one, how the disciples was with Jesus. Mom come up and said, my son will take care of the son said, now listen, Mom, my time's not ready. And she smiled, no doubt. Okay. And she went on. And she told the people, whatever my son tells you, do it. Is that faith? She knew who he was. So what we got to do, because we know who Jesus is, right. we got to do the same thing. So we go up to a lost person and we share the gospel and we pray for him and we leave, we should say, my friend's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. Just like Mary said. And then you look at them, he said, now you just do what I've told you according to God's word and you're going to get a great blessing. They got water that turned into wine. And I can imagine them disciples sitting there saying, John, this is pretty cool. Jesus just turned that water into wine. Judas is probably saying, yeah, we could probably sell that for a lot of money, don't you think? <laughs> and Peter's sitting there and said, but don't you understand, he turned the water into wine. And John said, yeah, I love it when he does amazing things. And they just keep going. And maybe I shouldn't sit and think about this stuff, but I do. How cool it would have been to be there. And then how sad it would have been when they were standing in the circle as he was tied to the center beam in the center and they were whipping him. How sad that was. How sad that would be. But do you know that in that event there was someone smiling? Satan was in the midst of that. He was smiling because he was thinking, Aha, I got him, I got him, I got him, I got him. When they nailed on the cross, don't you know Satan threw a party? I think Satan and the demons had a three-day party. John and the disciples and all the other 120 people that was up there was mourning and uh, more uh, more mourning the death of Jesus and the Holy Spirit is not there yet but I think God was laying on the heart the words that Jesus said to them because that's what you do when you mourn someone that you love and you lost them you start reflecting back and then 
Mary and Elise go to the tomb and it's empty. And Mary runs back. Peter and John takes off. The race begins. When they get to the tomb, it's empty. They go back and they tell them, it was really empty, it was really empty. Jesus is up. Hey, don't you remember? He said on the third day, He would rise. Mm -hmm. And while they're discussing things, guess what Jesus does? He pops in in a room with locked doors. Amen. Say, hey boys, peace. <laughs> peace is not the word I would have needed if He popped in like that. I would have needed resuscitated. Because can you imagine they're in the midst and all of a sudden Jesus appears. But God told me this while I was praying. Jesus is in the midst where two or three are gathered together. Why are you so amazed at that? He's right there with you. And He sent you a comforter. He sent you somebody to help you. So you don't have to worry about it. You have a teammate. It's just like this. Even the bench warmers on the Super Bowl football game at the end, the winning team, even the bench warmer gets a rain. That's what we are. We might be bench warmers. We might not do great, wonderful things, but every little thing counts. Jesus always looked at the little things, not the great things. And, and do you know at the end, we're all going to the same heaven. The same heaven. Don't you understand? All of the brothers and sisters, no matter what we put on the door, we're all going to a place that has one name, and it's the city of Jerusalem, and he calls it the new city, but it's heaven that comes down. And we're going to live in a glorified city. When we go into heaven where the streets are gone. The Bible says there's many mansions there. And I believe then I'm going to go after I see the Lord uh, and thank Him for dying for me and I get to go to the Father for a few million years and sit on His lap. The next thing I want to do is go by that river of life that flows through where the green pastures are. Just sit at a shade tree and listen to the brook water. What a comforting thing to know. God has all this plan for all of us. We get the same gift. We get the same ring at the end of the game. It's worth it. People say, well, I can't do much. Every little bit is worth it. And you get the same prize as a person that does a whole bunch. You know, this is what he made me realize. Because I, I kept saying, Father, I don't see great numbers. I don't see people being saved. He says, Billy Graham seen people saved all the time. And you got a chair right next to Billy Graham in my place. Listen to me, people. God is not going to separate us in heaven. We're going to be a family at one table. Now, last night, I met with all my brothers. We was there. And it's always kind of emotional when we pray before we eat because we thank God because half of our family is up in heaven. And uh, my youngest brother prayed last night and he said, Lord, my oldest brother is not with us, but he's in spirit. And mom and daddy stopped listening. And he, you know, everybody started getting a little emotional. And he said, but one day, we all are going to be sitting at the same table again. Hallelujah. Isn't that going to be a blessing? Amen. Amen. My other brother had set us all on the same table. There's a whole bunch of tables down there, but he lined us all up. He said, everybody sit at this table. It's kind of like the Waltons, you know. <laughs> and we're lined up. There's no chairs missing. Somebody sitting next to each other. And I was just feeling so blessed. I'm at the end towards the, uh, the furnace room. And I'm looking at the edge of the table. And I, you know, I was kind of depressed all day thinking of, you know, mom and dad and Kenny, or I mean, Dean and Michelle and Patty and Tim. And just kept thinking. 
But when I looked at that table, it was full. The table was full. What a blessing. What a blessing. He's getting us prepared. We're all teammates. We have a reason to smile this morning. And uh, this is my last example to make you understand we all get the same thing at the end. I just want to share this with you because I think it's really cute. It's like uh, these people that like to climb mountains. Now, that's not me, but there are people that like that. And they're climbing a mountain. When they start coming down, they get caught in one of those amazing snowstorms in July. And they're coming down and they're freezing. Their hands are cold. They're, they can't feel their toes anymore. They're hungry. They're tired because you have to work extra coming out of that snow. But they come at the end and this guy said, what are you smiling about? You just come through a horrible snowstorm. He said, i got a room at Holiday Inn where there's food, a bed, and guess what? Warmth. Why can't we get that excited and smile all the time and they say, what do you smile? Say, I've got a mansion in heaven just waiting for me. I'm going to walk on the streets of gold. I'm going to see a lion lay next to a lamb. I'm going to see amazing things, but most of all, I'm going to see the man that saved me, the one that died for me. And he's going to take me and introduce me to the creator of all things. The one who spoke the words and it happened. There's a tree. There's, a, there's another tree, but make it different than that tree. And then he took a handful of dirt and he formed man to communicate, to uh, talk with. And when he breathed life into that man, God breathed life into man. And then he seen that even though God was there, he was working his garden that he gave him. This beautiful garden. But he was a little lonely. Because God was doing other things because it said God would come in the evening, in the cool of the evening. He will walk through the garden, right? That's what the Word says. And Adam would wait. I know God's coming. We should be that excited knowing that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. So we need to get ready. And uh, God seen that we, Adam was lonely. He made him a helpmate. God knew we would need help because Satan's alive and he's true. He has demons and bad things are going to happen to good people. But guess what? He sent us a helper. He sent us a helper, a comforter. He sent us one that can tell us what to do if we only trust him. Amen. And guess what? It's going to be just like the day that when Adam died, Adam is going to go to the same place that you're going if you know Jesus Christ. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Sit next and see the name tag, Adam. So what Adam are you? The first. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Or how would you like to talk to Noah? I think about that kind of stuff. And... Uh, the Lord reminded me, he says, now remember when you get to heaven, you're all going to be like Jesus. You're going to know all the answers. And then I'm going to think, maybe I don't want to know all the answers. Huh? But you know, at the end of the trail, there's a place called heaven. At the end of our life. And I love the way that uh, one of my brothers said last night as we uh, left the... Uh, dining hall down there and I don't know why we do this we all get there, we eat and after we eat we clean up and we all go to my house and there are people everywhere sitting on the floor, couches, chairs uh, we have folding chairs and uh, one of them said this is pretty cool don't you think he said don't you think it would be really cool if Jesus would come while we're celebrating Christmas I said man that would be cool and you know, this is one of my brothers, I, I never hear him talk about religion.
But you know, he just opened up. And he was sharing with us, and we're laughing, and we're carrying on. And he kept telling us, you know, he says, I just know that one day, one day, all of my problems are going to be gone. I said, yes, sir. He struggles. He has leukemia. He pays horrible money for a horrible drug that's giving you horrible side effects, but it says it's helping him. He lost 20 pounds in one week, and the next week after medicine, he gained 15, and it's not good stuff. But he said, one day, I'm not going to worry about this. Amen. Because when Jesus comes, I'm going to be perfect before I get to heaven. Come on. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. All the diseases, all the hardships are going to be left here. And what's God going to do to it? He's going to destroy it forevermore. He said he will burn it and there will be no more. When you get to heaven, there's no sin, there's no sorrow, there's no pain. It is only joy. Hallelujah. Wouldn't that make you smile? So I'm asking you this morning, what are you smiling about? I'm smiling because I know my name's written in the last book of life. Amen. And as I look out here by your professions of faith, I know that I'm talking to saints, but I'm going to ask you this. Are you out there smiling like you're smiling in here? I know we all have to go through hardships, hard times. But God said it's all here to help each other. Yeah. To pray for each other, lift each other up. To encourage us. That's what I'm going to do, offer you this morning. If you need encouragement, I want you to come and let us pray for you. Let us be your encourager. If you have a burden on your heart, let's just give it to the Lord this morning. I want you to come. I want you to just to be true to whatever God's telling you. So as you stand in deep place, I want you to just search your heart and know that we'll pray with you if you come where you stand. because you know your life's your name's written in the book of life Amen. that you have something to be excited about are you giving it all to the Lord he says give it all to me matter of fact he says cast all of your cares upon me because I care for you he wants you to have peace and the blessing of peace is to know that it will be well for you. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your words today to know that we have a place of refuge to come to find help when we need it, to find a place to celebrate our joys be with one another and yet father we can be the workers that you send out two by two so father i'm asking you to use this church starting with me father and all of these people that we will be workers for the kingdom of god that everything we do in our lives even at our jobs even at our our volunteer spots every place we go father let Christ be seen in us. Let us take a stand. Because you said you was going to build your church upon a rock and not a sandy foundation. So we know at the end we all get the same heaven. We thank you for that. Father, I love you. And I thank you for sending your son to die for me to die for a world of all kinds of sin 
Father, I couldn't even name all the sins. But I know that Jesus' blood is powerful enough to cover them all. Father, I thank you for the comforter. I thank you for what Christ did to allow the comforter to come as he died, as he walked and taught. And he sent the comforter. He told us that he, he will give us wisdom. He will give us knowledge. And Father, he would even, when we can't pray with words, that the Holy Spirit will groan in for us. And that you would receive the word, Jesus. And the Bible says that you will intercede for us. Because where two or three are gathered together. Because wherever your child is, he will intercede. Yes, Lord, there's a lot of bad things going on in this world. People die because of these things. But we know one day it will all be taken away. It will be so worthy. So, Father, we give you glory, we give you praise, we give you honor. And I ask you to bless this place. The peace will fall upon it, that it will be well with all of our lives. Bless us, these people, your church, your teammates, the ones that you said, For I so loved the world, and you named each and every one of us that I sent my son for. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you for that. You made it so easy. So, Father, as we leave this place and this year closes out, we praise you for all the blessings. But most of all, Father, we're looking exciting. We've got a smile on our face because we know the harvest is ready. The workers are few. But we're praying to the Lord of the harvest that your kingdom will grow and grow. Go with us. Give us peace. Give us joy. For we ask these things in Christ's name. And amen. May the face of God shine upon you. And as you are blessed, and I know you're all blessed, take them blessings and share them with someone else. Now go in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.